Okay, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to another edition of the Sydney Saxman Network Q&A sessions. I hope you're well wherever you are in Australia and across the world. Um, you may notice I am missing an important feature, uh, my face hugger. Uh, I've uh, decided this year with a, a couple of colleagues to uh, participate in Movember. So um, you'll notice I'm kind of starting to grow a little bit of stubble on my top lip. Um, I'm a bit of a slow grower, so it'll take a bit of time. But yeah, if you're interested, I have a thing somewhere online. But anyway, that's uh, enough of that. Um, this afternoon, we're going to be talking to a fascinating musician uh, based in Sydney called Stuart Grandevar. Uh, yeah, so there, yeah, apologies. <laughs> yeah. Stuart Vandegraaff. It has been a long Thanks, day, ladies and gentlemen. I do apologize, Stuart. <laughs> now, um, uh, needless to say, um, once I get his name right, Stuart is a fascinating musician, as I said. He is a multi instrumentalist, uh, he's a composer, performer. And uh, he's based in Sydney currently, but he's originally from Adelaide. And um, he's had a diverse uh, range of experiences and training in classical, jazz, and world music. So he has quite a uh, unusual conglomerate of musical influences and styles in his playing, and consequently his musical output um, uh, demonstrates you know, uh, such a great range of versatility and originality in what he does. Uh, so without further ado, and I will get your name right this time, I do apologise, Stuart. Stuart Vandegraaff, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Dave. It's hard to believe that that wasn't rehearsed, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it wasn't, <laughs> believe me. As I said, it has been a long day. I've been up since, I don't know. Anyway, it's all good. Yeah, so um, yeah. I'm just going to break the ice a little bit here, Stu. And um, oh, do you mind if I call you Stu, just because I know you and you know, Stuart's just a That's little bit That's what I call formal. me. That's fine. Stu's good. All right, thanks, Stu. Um, so just starting with a bit of an icebreaker, uh, what was the thing that got you started on this journey on saxophone? So what was the thing that made you pick saxophone? Yeah, so um, my brother's a couple of years older than me. Um, in fact, he said I was from Adelaide. I can add a little bit of um, Sydney Saxophone Network um, detail to that little part of the story of me. Please do. That um, many people okay. tuned in, but I'm um, I'm actually Victorian originally. Um, we followed my dad around in the country. He got a PhD in um, epidemiology, actually, um, but for sheep and and cows. Um, mm -hmm. And so we found ourselves in lots of regional centres. So um, after having lived in Port Lincoln for a little while, um, we lived in Port Augusta, um, which these are sort of uh, regional centres in South Australia for those of you playing at home. <laughs> and um, so my brother was about 10 and we just moved to Port Augusta and, you know, he wanted to play in the band. So he brought home an instrument, which he said, oh, yeah, I've got myself a saxophone here. And he brings a case home and opens it up. And um, sorry, I, I got the punchline wrong. Let me get that around the, the right way. There we go. That's okay. That's um, okay. So he said, I brought a trumpet home, right? <laughs> um, and he wanted to play the trumpet. So he opened the case and we all sort of gathered around as a family, the first musical instrument, more or less, in the family. Um and it turns out it was a saxophone. And my brother was bitterly disappointed. You know, he thought, oh, that's a sax, Ugh, stuff, that sort of thing. Hmm. Um, but uh, I looked at this thing and I went, I'm, I was probably seven years old, I guess, something like that. Um, and I looked at this thing and I went, wow, what's that? I've got to know how to make, because it's so, um, you know, intricate, the, the mechanism itself. It's a wonderful hmm. tool. Hmm. And then the idea that you could make music out of this thing what the heck kind of you know madness was this? And so that's really what got me into it um, was um, the wrong instrument sent home. My brother sent the saxophone back to school, uh, came back a few days later with trumpet and did that. That's a whole different sort of story. He did pretty well at trumpet as well. Um, but um, yeah, it took me a while to get my own saxophone. Um, and by that stage, we were in Adelaide. You, you're dead right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what made me pick the saxophone. It was really just having seen it. And I suppose at the time, um, you know, we're talking many moons ago here, but there were saxophones in popular culture that even a child, you know, growing up on the streets in, um, you know, rural South Australia. Well, this um, is true. Yeah. Yeah. To, you know, like, um, I don't know if, if um, Willy Wilde was on um, telly yet. You know, there's the whole <laughs> Hey Hey Saturday mob. But there certainly were saxophones around. Um, and Don Burroughs, of course, was, was very much on TV back in those days. I remember those... Um, those movies he made with Malcolm Douglas, mm. um, where the soundtrack was Don doing this incredible avant-garde alto flute and really adventurous music, you know, and that was the soundtrack to this thing. So as a kid, you know, there was much more music in, in you know, in, um, in the popular eye, I guess, like in front of you. 
um, and it was Australian music at really high level. So you know, it was it seemed a natural thing to do. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I remember as a kid myself, uh, like uh, seeing like old reruns of the old uh, Malcolm Douglas uh, documentaries, and I was just the soundtrack was just like. Man, that's really cool. It was like really eerie and haunting, but it sort of yeah. really fit the the portraits of the landscapes they have up there. And then, um, you know, being a young kid, I didn't know it was Don Burrows at the time. And then when I found out, I was just like, blew my mind. Right. But yeah, right. there you go. Right. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I, I apologies. I had originally thought you were, you know, uh, thoroughbred uh, um, South Australian, but obviously not. I stand corrected. Victorian. Don't let on to. Don't let on though. All right, fair enough. Um, <laughs> Well, all right, moving on to the next question. Um, maybe you can talk th talk us through, um, you know, your early days and your training on the saxophone, like, uh, you know, about your education, some of your early teachers, and, you know, experiences, um, you know, from when you started up to, you know, your undergraduate years and, you know, influential teachers and uh, thing experiences that you had during this time. All that sort of thing. So um, yeah. I was really lucky that... I got to a music school, um, well, not a music school, but I was at a school where there was a really good band program. Music, um, there was a, an established um, choir which um, went touring. The girls' choir went touring to Europe pretty much every year. Mm -hmm. um, they had a, a good school orchestra, which um, you know that's a thing, you know. Um, so uh, that was very much part of it. We also did musicals at school, um, and I had that triple um, problem, I guess, when I started music quite early that. Uh, I got all the lead roles in, in the musicals, the musical theatre productions that we put on. Um, but I also like playing Aussie Rules footy and I also like being the band. And the three things just aren't compatible necessarily time-wise and, and, you know, where you put your energy. So, um, yeah, there was it was a really good music school um, and it had a good big band in it as well, um, which lots of good musicians came through. Lots of people who are pretty prominent musicians in the world. Um, came through that very small um, little little band program. Well, not small. It was um, anyway a well resourced, nice band program. Um, and also we had Don Burrows and James Morrison. That was when they were kind of um, getting set up. Uh, you know, I think um, there was a, a couple of connections, but they came and played and hung out and did their um, workshops very early on. Later on, it became a much a much more established thing that they were doing. And of course, years later, those guys set up the Mount Gambier. Uh, whole thing and and there's been um, you know such a great legacy that's come out of that uh, mm -hmm. energy that they put into South Australia and it's now through UNSW sorry uh, Uni Uni is SA uh, there's a, a degree which is um, sort of still attached to that whole effort of endeavour um, for those guys so um, we had really great players you know I got to sit next to Don Burrows in the school band um, playing wow. lead alto um, quite young and um, and James Morrison as well they they'd come down every year and hang out with the band and we do stuff um, but apart from that we had great uh, old old boys from the school you know sort of thing who come and do um, gigs with us when we when we needed a few extra horns for public gigs so we had lots of um, you know players like Robbie Chenow who's a local Adelaide trumpeter uh, would come out and, and hang out and uh, um, oh my gosh Don Whiffen. There were, there were saxophone players, these sort of crusty old dudes who smelled like <laughs> cigarettes who'd come out and um, and play with the school band, sometimes wow. dressed in a school uniform. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd play great. And they were playing off the sheet, you know. They were playing all those notes. They, they understood all those chord symbols and um, they could play just like Charlie Parker, you wow. know. Um, one of the really Im important things, and I think this is worth mentioning just as far as because we'll talk about mentorship and that later on but mm -hmm. um so uh, dave longdon was the band leader at that school and at one stage he gave me a tape you remember tapes yeah before I remember CDs? <laughs> with the snap of you <laughs> <laughs> and um on the tape it said charlie parker and the music on that tape was out of sight I, I listened to it and i knew every note and at the age of i guess 12 i was transcribing everything on it um, like I, I knew how to play what was on there and um, thinking it was Charlie Parker. And it was only a couple of years later on that I uh, was, well, I worked out that it wasn't actually Charlie Parker. Only about a third of it was Charlie Parker. Right. But the other two thirds was an album called Musique du Bois from Phil Woods. Um, and there's a connection with Phil Woods as, um, you know, with Charlie Parker, that whole legacy, mm -hmm. that, you know, whole thing. Um, but I remember the summer nose was the was the thing that I first transcribed, as I say, just sort of you know in my bedroom at twelve without knowing what transcription was. I listened to that album. I was like, wow, that's 
just beautiful. I've got to figure out what he's doing and uh, and worked out all of that. So just that role um, that mentors sometimes have for students can be a really pivotal thing for them. Mm-hmm. And it might be something tiny, insignificant that you do, but um, actually there's a, there's a deep act of, um, uh, I, I was going to say love. It's not always the right word, but um, that, that'll fit the, the sentiment at the moment. But when you create something like that for a student and say, hey, check this out, there's some energy that can, you know, really transform somebody's life right there sometimes. So um, that that was a pretty pretty important moment growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, I don't know, we had lots of opportunities, but I wasn't really going to be a music student. I wasn't going to be like a, a music major when I was okay. going through school. Um, it was just something that I did because I, I loved it. Like being in band was, was cool, like that sound and, you know, especially when things were in tune. And even in the orchestra, which, you know, to me was a bit daggy, you know, being attracted to the dark side as I was. Um, but I played, I was the first saxophone player in that school orchestra. Um, and I uh, transcribed uh, or, or site transposed um, bassoon parts and bass clarinet parts. And basically whatever the gap was, there were a lot of French horn. Um, so I got pretty used to reading weird um, transcriptions from strange, um, you know, from strange um, clefts and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and making sense of the music in that way. But basically, wherever there was a, a gap in the orchestra, um, we'd, we'd, I'd fill it with tenor saxophone, you know, occasional ramblings, and occasionally I hit a good note. But that was <laughs> that was great as well. So, you know, there's all this great music experience that, that kind of came together. Um, and for a, a person who wasn't necessarily looking, I was more in the maths and physics side of things, you know, that, um, you know, I, my, I, I, but the first thing I went and studied um, wasn't music; it was engineering uh, right. at Adelaide okay. Uni. Um, so, uh, I, yeah. Anyway, that's a, that maybe a story we'll delve into. But oh, that no. was more the direction I was going in. Um, it was only after I realised that that wasn't for me that I went. What do I really like, you know, I, I kind of had a, a moment when I was about twenty or so, and just went, "What do I really like? What's going to be always challenging? What do I feel like I'm never going to know everything of?" Because it felt like there's other sort of dead end things that you can do. And then it's just a matter of turning the handle. But Mm -hmm. um, music felt like it was this beautiful, open-ended, you know, uh, would always be challenging, always stimulating and and beautiful and lovely. And I just went, well, yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to give that a go. (laughs) That's 30 years ago almost. Yeah. And, you know, you're doing pretty well with it uh, ever since. uh, You know, you're, uh, you're constantly gigging and out there doing things and um yeah and going back to what you were saying before like um early uh early on when anyone's learning the instrument um you know often it's not just about you know having the lessons with great teachers i mean yes that's important because obviously you know that's where you get skills and developing that relationship between the teacher and you know that sort of helps formulate who you are as a musician but as you were saying that mentorship and you know having like influential people just sort of out of the blue you know or sometimes they say hey listen to this or check this out or do that and then you know mm. that can be a real turning point for a lot of musicians and it sounds like it was for you absolutely absolutely and so it's not uh, i guess um a lot of people um learn from a teacher more in a more direct way i guess they you know take that information and for me the the, the best experiences um are have been because i think you can teach yourself i think at the end of the day most of the the job of um you know any pursuit is um, that you're you're teaching yourself essentially. Other people might be able to describe things or show you things that help uh, you understand different concepts. But at the end of the day, it's your job to do the hard yards and, and teach yourself that stuff. So a lot of that's just logical extrapolation. You, you get introduced to a concept and you just follow that along. Um, and maybe if you follow that along and you're really into it, you might go beyond what the teacher ever had for themselves even or um, what might be in the books even sometimes. Yeah. Um, so it's the, it's sometimes like it's not the the linear um, teaching that's um, more appealing to me. It's the 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 um, almost like lightning strike moments or the you know the flash of light sort of moments where you just have a oh wow the realization that you know there's there's um, a whole what different way of thinking or a whole different way of approaching things. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right. Oh, interesting. Um, now, Stu, I do apologise. Uh, my neighbour's kids have um, rocked up. There's about eight of them, so you <laughs> might hear them in the background screaming and running around, but um, hopefully they don't come through on the microphone too much. But anyway, pursuing on. Um, so you um, 
uh, pursued an undergraduate degree in jazz. Yeah. Um, and then later on, you actually uh, uh, went and did a master's in uh, the, and excuse my pronunciation, Arabic makam, makwa, makam? Makam, yeah. Makam, makam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you yeah. maybe tell us a, bit, a little bit about, you know, obviously the jazz undergraduate, like from there, and then sort of how you ended up pursuing this seemingly, um, you know, completely uh, different style of music in uh, the postgraduate level. Right. Um, so, uh, it's a long, it's a, it is a long, so the academic thing, um, university and, and music, I'm not sure sometimes, um, especially um, for, for, for some learning, like a lot of the best learning um, happens between people. Yeah, um, universities, uh, I'm, I don't know. Um, I, I didn't have terribly great experiences, I've got to say, at um, either of the universities that I went to mm -hmm. uh, or any of the universities that I've, I've been to, but maybe that's more a, about me. Um, so there's this sort of a click that happens often in undergraduate, you know, um, and that certainly was the case when I was going through um, in, in, um, in Adelaide. And I wasn't part of that, you know, cool crowd, not that I aspired to be. But I, I do see that as a bit of a limitation also, um, you know, knowing some of the behaviour of, of some of the staff now, um, you, you sort of question what's, what's happened there. But I also think um, in many ways, look, I, I don't know if it's because of the academy or maybe I don't because of the way I don't understand the academy terribly well, but it seems like there's sort of deep seams of tradition that go through um, the academic institutions. Mm. Um, and maybe a lot of the time that doesn't serve the progress of the thinking in that, that area, if you know what I mean. So um, I, I, it's a long way of answering a question, but I, I see Makam um, as being fundamentally linked with the whole canon of European music. And the way I know that um, is because I've experienced that I've played those, I've played the instruments that um, have led to us playing what I believe playing the scales that are the formation of European music. And so I don't see them as being separate traditions. I see them as being a logical linear, this is, you know, thousands and thousands of years tradition that we're involved with. Um, and they're, they're part of the same timeline. Um, even even the way the improvisation was treated, um, and I'm glad to say that there's there's been some movement in that um, within, you know, sort of the more traditional um ways of learning things i think and, and you're very much you know that's um been a, a big area for you i know is is you mm. know as a as someone who's been taught to be essentially not a, i'm not denigrating it say dot reader and, and follow the you know um that traditional classical approach of things uh, which has in the past um excluded improvisation yes <laughs> i mean I, i'm sure paganini was um you know an incredible virtuoso solo as so as, as, as much as mozart was sort of a mm. um you know a, a well coined phrase if you like so um look undergraduate in in jazz um in adelaide was really because i liked the saxophone i told you i had an epiphany back in the day um, when I was halfway through an engineering degree and I just went, oh, this is not for me and these this is not my world. Mm. Um, yeah. Although I'm, I'm still fascinated by numbers and, and, you know, those big physics things that, you know, um, I'm still a stargazer and, I, uh, you know, we look through the telescope and, and, and all that and, and um, oh, wow. um, you know, love my, I love mathematics and I, I've got a, a big group of friends who, who did follow that, um, that, those sorts of pursuits and they've done incredibly well with them and they, you know, help me expand my thinking as well um but that world wasn't for me um and so I, I thought as a saxophone player in australia in the 90s it, it, there seemed to be far more currency in learning how to improvise rather than um, to go and learn to be a classical saxophone player it, my, in my mind the job was well there's no orchestral chairs anyway so you know true, and once true. they come up you know you'll be in a long line of people who are eminently more qualified and probably like the music better than than i did um i'm not that much into the uh, i mean I, i'm very much appreciative of, of um you know that that field of things but it just wasn't for me just to say it mm -hmm. like that so i thought there's more currency for me in, in going to learn to improvise but at the, at the same time, I mean, I've been instructed well. I had some good teachers when I was going through school. Um, Helen Menzel and Cheryl Barclay, mm -hmm. um, both incredible uh, local. I think both of them served in the local police band in Adelaide for, for years, yeah, right. uh, separate times, yeah, right. and, and um, uh, great, 
great players and um you know well well across all the dots and all the you know uh the the old yellow books like this one behind me that you and i know so well from our classical saxophone dots oh yes the um, old box of caprices the caprices and and you know introducing me to you know those wonderful things with uh, 11 note scales and you know uh, Cargella was a was a particular favourite because of the angularity and the unexpected mm. dissonance and 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 weird groupings of times. I liked all that mathematical stuff. I still do very much like that mathematical arithmetic way of playing. Mm -hmm. um, so that so the undergraduate degree was really about um, uh, accumulating skills, which I thought would be more salient in in the real world as wanting to be a player as opposed to being necessarily a teacher or being a, a writer or a um, you know. Uh, any of those other things. I just wanted yeah. to, to understand how to play and, and, and have a, as free a concept as possible. Um, and then, uh, so years passed, you know, I got a job in the Navy band, I got a job later on in the police band, and um, I yeah. did a heap, a heap of things in between in 20 years. Um, and then I thought, well, um, I, if I'm going to go back to university and, and do some research, um, I feel like it should be, I should, the statement I want to make is in an area that um, maybe is underrepresented um, because of this sort of um, weird schism. You've got this idea of classical versus jazz in, in music. And um, I, I was interested in all that other stuff in between. In the meantime, I'd learned about salsa and Brazilian music. I, um, you know, my wife is from the Middle East, so I was introduced to Middle Eastern music. Um, and that's a whole different world as well. You know, there's all these other notes that we don't use in there. Mm. Um, and that was tantalizing for me as well. Um, and not just from an academic point of view, but really from, it grabs you first from within. And then you go, well, I have to search for that sound and make use of the sound for myself once I can, once I can track it down. Um, so yeah, the, 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 study I, I guess there's any number of things that you can write about at academic level you know um, mm. write a dissertation masters it'll be compelling and um, because so little basic research has been done it hasn't been documented well unfortunately we're in a bit of a rarefied um, area that um, you know there's less activity in music um, and there's less high level academic ac activity in music um, uh, than in other fields let's say so the the progress of the fields has developed rather slowly and, and so I did feel like I wanted to put something in there which was um, about my journey in music something unique that I had to bring um, mm -hmm. and not talk too much about my idiolect and that sort of self-serving function of, of music but just to say look I discovered some things along the way and this might be interesting to other people and and what it was was um, I had that challenge of, of well I had Arabic music to play repertoire to play Mm -hmm. My instrument was the saxophone, but I, I didn't know how to get those notes. I couldn't even hear those quarter tones to start with, let alone to know that they're not just out of tune notes, but they are perfectly in tune quarter tones. Mm. That wasn't part of my you know, world of, of music at all. So yeah. I thought that's an yeah. interesting, uh, in, interesting um, puzzle to solve, if you like. Um, so I applied the engineering brain to it and I said, well, if I practice this in this way and I find the right solutions and then I quantify those solutions and then um, come up with a, a pretty well um, watertight way for all saxophone players to play 24 tones, 24-tone uh, chromatic scale, then I, I'm not the first person to have done it. I'm, I'm not saying that, but maybe the, applying the, that in, in a written form to the Arabic, um, specifically the Arabic makam, um, you know, set. Um, there's enough uniqueness there, I think, and you know, um, that's. So it, it really was part of the, a product of the um, of my journey in music, really. Mm. No, it's yeah. really fascinating, and I think that actually makes a lot of sense. That um, sort of engineering background that you had um, really does explain a lot in terms of your interests and sort of how you sort of gravitated towards it. Because you know, you the way you like to try and problem solve and work out things from that angle, and applying that in a musical context as well. Um, and, you know, the masters, um, you know, is spot on, like ethnomusicology um, is, you know, a, a highly, you know, it, there should be more done in that field, uh, in particular, you know, applications of, um, you know, uh, how to sort of adapt that in terms of, you know, say Western music's 
well, Western instrumentalists on how you can sort of approach that sort of thing. I know, for instance, mm. uh, there's a, a Japanese uh, saxophonist called uh, Ryo Noda, and he, you know, back in the 70s, he was trying to adapt uh, shakuhachi music for classical saxophone, and he was a classical right. saxophonist. So, you know, it's it's just a fascinating world. And, um, you know, I think, you know, the research you've done on it is certainly a um, an important achievement in uh, the saxophone holistically, for sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. well, like I say, I wasn't trying to do something that was all about what Stu's doing, you know, that narcissistic, no, you know, yeah, auto idiotic yeah. thing. Um, and I, it did occur to me that there's, well, it, it's something that a lot of musicians have avoided. And certainly um, I, I've read reviews lately of, uh, let's say, peak uh, uh, um, music uh, performance outfits that mm. haven't done, haven't performed so well um because they, there's a lack of cultural understanding, um, there's a real resistance to playing these notes, to to, to understanding that style of music um, mm. within certain fields. And and basically all it is, is we live in a far more globalized world now. I've got far more, like if back in the days when we used to um, basically share um, media, which is mm. essentially what music is, it's a form of medium and it was captured, so recorded, it's the, 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 the um, transmission of that happened traditionally among English-speaking countries. Now, we, we don't have that. We, we're a, a global world yeah, uh, and yeah. we're a global nation. And um, I mean, for instance, I have far more Turkish friends than I have American friends. Um, maybe that's part of my selective process, but it's not really <laughs> intentional. Um, but um, the music that we're, the media that we're exposed to or, or can choose to be exposed to, um, is is far greater than it ever has been in time. Any point in time, right now, is as, as good as um, the dissemination of musical ideas in the world um, is going. And as if you look at music as uh, one of the high, as I do, I see music as one of the highest vibrations of human culture, um, of human communication. It's nonverbal. Um, it represents so much about culture and values and um, training and um, so many things about society um so it it does feel like we're, we're operating in in fairly special territory um when we're when we're working with music and now this this communicative idea um can only be impeded by holding on to nationalistic sort of values which are often tied to the way that music is learned in conservatorium mm. so um to me um yeah the, the more we arm ourselves with the skills to play properly international music the more relevant the music we make today will be and the better we'll be um, positioned to make uh, high quality communicative art into the future. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah, yeah, spot on. It's it's a huge topic um, and, um, you know, you're, it's spot on, like in terms of, uh, I'm going to share my age a little bit, but, um, you know, uh, you, you tell students, you know, the, the amount of resources out there and the accessibility to all styles of music is so easy, just, you know, with the finger... The, the touch of a finger, you got access to, you know, the worldwide network of music resources and things like that. And, you know, spot on because, you know, uh, particularly now of COVID with you know, the prominence of online performances and recordings and things like that, you know, you're engaging with audiences beyond, you know, the local audiences that you would do at a local venue. Like, you know, it's a worldwide yeah. stage yeah. essentially. So, you know, depending on what kind of music you uh, venturing into and playing and things like that, you know, there's, it's certainly, you know, you need to have um, some element of, uh, particularly with world music, like if you're going to take on uh, music of another culture, you know, you should do your homework and, you know, make sure there's some authenticity in what you're doing and, you know, make sure that what you're doing is true to what that music uh, traditionally stands for. True, true. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think um, this conversation about cultural appropriation is, um, is very relevant as well. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, though, like, if I... I just speaking from my own, my own point of view, um, I, I'm an artist, you know. Um, I can only, I, I'm Takaru Stew at the end of the day. I'm, I'm, you know, this sort of mongrel Aussie from <laughs> Victoria somehow via South Australia, ended yeah, up yeah. In, in New yeah. South Wales, you know. Takaru Stew only comes out when I go camping, by the way. But um, that's who, that's really like a fundamental part of who I am. I like to wear thongs and, and get sand between my toes and, and go down the beach and, you know, um, Oh, you get that salt water on your skin and all, all that sort of thing. Aussie values. Mm. So um, if we can, it's all about that take one step, you know, in, if, if you want to 
increase communication. I take a step towards you. You take a step towards me. We'll be closer together. We can maybe do something more productively in, in that way. Um, so, yeah, cultural appropriation, it's a funny area um, because I, I look at a lot of, um, well, what a, what a lot of jazz really is, especially swing, mm. um, there's, there's huge amounts of cultural appropriation um, all through that. So, yeah. you know, is it is it authentic for um, an Aussie singer in London to be singing about what, what it means to miss New Orleans? I mean, that feels a pretty disingenuous. <laughs> True. Um, but for me, yeah, I was exposed to these, you know, to Brazilian music through friends and just through um, just the sheer the joy of it. And that's a culture of music where, I mean, I don't want to speak broadly of, of the way nations share values, but I found learning Brazilian music, for instance, really easy because they just want to share. Like you meet a Brazilian who plays cavaquinho, he wants to show you these chords and you meet someone who plays, you know, hand percussion. They want to show you tambourine patterns. They want you to understand about batucada and, um, you know, the sort of tradition and, and, and all of that um, and how it ties in with Boston. They want to share all that information with you. Mm. So it's not like it's a hard yeah. pursuit. Um, and that's not so much what I found with, with other areas. But so that learning about Brazilian music, that's just, wow, I love that. You know, Tucker is too digs that. <laughs> so <laughs> let's uh, let's learn some of that. And, and that's where that came from. Um, and the same thing with the Arabic music. Okay, look, yeah, like, look at me, you know. <laughs> What's a guy like me doing playing the Ney? Look, the reason for playing the Ney at all was um, just to learn the, the context of those microtones to help me hear them better and to understand the system um, that it comes from. As a consequence of my the academic pursuit, I mean, I, the instrument really captivates me, but I know in 10 lifetimes, I'm not going to be a nazen, you know, someone who is a, is a real master of that set of instruments or those instruments. Hmm. Um, the nay, I don't know if everyone knows what the nay is, but uh, this is a term, uh, Turkish yeah. one here. Could so you a, give us maybe like a bit of a, a, a demo, if that's okay? Oh, uh, I knew you'd oh, say that, but sorry. I, I wasn't planning a bit, and it's hard to do when you're smiling, so I'll see if I can not smile. practice on the nay but it's really yeah that's the, that's the same as what we use for um for saxophone reeds arando donax it's the same material um, yeah, right. which i've developed quite a fascination for this magical cane um over my you know because that's what we do We're, it's all connected to the cane really that's mm. um if that's my religion mm. i'm i'm a part of the 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 cult of pan as the pan pipes you know um yeah, right. really were yeah, right. Um, and there's wonderful stories about the first cane. Um, am I allowed to uh, allowed to tell a, sp a slightly spicy story here? Sure, it's, it's all right. I think sure. it's, it's your not Q &A, man. Bad. Well, so you know about Pan, right? Yeah. He's represented as half man, half goat, mm -hmm. right? And he was a god. He was one of the Greek gods, right? Back in the old days. Um, and um, so sometimes he liked. Um, frolicking with female humans mm -hmm. um, and sometimes he liked frolicking with female goats if we, if we're too deep already I don't no, know no no anyway, no I'm curious the, to see where you're going day, with this one day one of the female goats that Pan approached refused his amorous advances and enraged Pan turned the she goat into the cane the giant Nile reed cane. And this happened up in the, um, well, in that area um, in the south of Lebanon, in the north of, well, the Palestinian country, if you call it by certain names, or, you know, you could call it by um, the, the valley, if you like, but it has many names, but it's in that Middle Eastern area. Okay. Um, and so um, that was the first cane, the first reed cane. Um, and this is a creation story, if you like. And out of that cane, because he was vindictive, but also a bit whimsical. Pan made the first flute, the first neigh, out of the she-goat and played her at his whim. So it's an interesting story. But the fact that this flute and this cane is tied in with 
that ancient um, religious belief, as well as far more ancient ones, they found these flutes, exactly these flutes, in the pyramids. Um, and they were still playable. They got uh, Mahmoud Afat. It's a big story, but I won't go too deep into it. But um, <laughs> they got one of the preeminent Egyptian um, players to play those nays. And using it, he was able to discern that, uh, discern the scale that was being used by pharaonic musicians, high priestesses usually. Uh, and you're talking about 3,500 years before Christ. You're talking like five and a half thousand years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the scale is exactly the same because the proportions is, is exactly the same. You know this one, this is um, Hijaz, it's like the half of the harmonic minor. Hmm. So that's a heptatonic there. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, that's the, that's the, that's the um, um, half the scale. And if I do the other half the scale, it's the same fingering. And thus was born the heptatonic scale. Yeah, right. There you go. Interesting stories. That is That's an interesting the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the reason that, the reason I learned to play the nay really was was just to understand the context of those microtones. Some of which I played in a little um, tuckus in before. It wasn't mm -hmm. to become a performer, but as it as it went, um, it turns out that there's not very many nay players in Sydney, and there's no. not um, many nay players at all who can read. Um, and so that's made me quite useful in a number of recording <laughs> sessions and, and gigs that we do every year. And, you know, it's, it's a nice sideline to have. I, I'm not pretending ever to be, um, a, you know, a wonderful player of the day. I'm not immersed enough in that culture um, to be. Um, but it's certainly something I've really enjoyed learning about. And student as I am, uh, I can still incorporate lots of that into what I use, you know, for the, the peak, for the performance things that I do. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, I think we've gone a little bit off topic, but that's cool. That's all right. That's what we all do. Um, <laughs> but I might just bring it back a little bit. Um, so in terms of, um, like, you know, you, you have an interest in, you know, numerous different musical styles. And um, the, the, the great thing about you is that, you know, you're kind of like, you know, there's no limits as to what kind of music you're into. And I think, you know, that sort of openness and, um, you know, that sort of approach, you know, approaching every sort of musical style and whatever context you're playing in, you're always there with an open mind and you're approaching it and how you'd approach it. But in terms of like uh, and musical influences for you, what are some standout influences that have sort of um, mm. uh, formulated your uh, well, your mus musical uh, identity, I guess? What do I do? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I can go chronologically if you like, but I, obviously I mentioned Phil Woods earlier uh, and alto saxophone and, and that post-bop style is still home base for me. Um, so, you know, I, I played through the Charlie Parker Omni book when I was a kid. I, uh, Charlie Parker is, you know, what a monstrous you know, player. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, um, so I guess when you start out, you don't realise that you're you're listening to the world's best and it's not going to get better than that. That's as good as they get. Mm. Um, I've already mentioned Don Burrows as well, who um, was, I think it's really important to see local players um, who, who have achieved um, the, the world's best, um, you know, level because that's certainly what Don was, um, you know, part of. Um, so that, that was really um, directly influential as well as the local players around me. Um, I remember... In second year, uh, we had, um, I can't remember the name of the, the coursework, but it was one of the undergraduate um, subjects that we did on a Thursday afternoon or something, and everyone would bring a CD in um, mm. and play yeah. for the, you know, the group. And I think it was a mix of second and third years. Um, so uh, you'd bring in a bit of music and you'd play it. And so, you know, people would be bringing in like, you know, Hank Mobley or Coltrane or, uh, you know, I was into, I think, um, uh, Joshua Redman and Chris Potter at the time and still yeah, am fantastic yeah. players um, and uh, Matt McDonald I think he's still part of the he still plays tenor in the Cops band in um, in Adelaide uh, brought in a, a recording of Jan Garbarek um, it's yeah, the right, trio right. called Mada uh, with um, uh, Shaka Hussain and uh, Amar Brahim uh, the Oud player and uh, that moment that single moment um changed everything for me because i'd been that's what i was really hearing um the polyphonic way of approaching um uh, jazz you know lots of chord scale and you can go anywhere you want and they mm. don't necessarily have to relate and it's all very mathematical and abstract um, i'm still a much more a modal player which i think um I, is sort of home base i guess um i i do like to extract the, the meaning from modes in that way um 
So uh, hearing those monstrous players and knowing what Garbrecht had played like before in his free jazz days, and then hearing this paired back, completely austere, tone-driven, tuning harmonics, harmonically perfect uh, music, which does does wonderful things for the cells of your body, as you know. Um, I, I listened to that recording. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about. And then I went and chased up um, Coltrane's later stuff, uh, where it was uh, going to the Eastern philosophy thing. Uh, and there's also Yusuf Latif in that mix as well, uh, um, another one of the, the hidden Bill Evans, um, mm-hmm. who uh, who played with Cannonball's band. That's how I came across Yusuf Latif. He played with Cannonball Adley's um, septet, uh, and and he had this um, Eastern approach as well. So I was um, you know sort of already leaning in that way, mm-hmm. um, and then I got involved um, in in with WOMAD, uh, which is that wonderful world music festival that happens every year, every mm-hmm. once every two years at the time in Adelaide and uh, um, got introduced to a lot of musicians there. Uh, and that's when I, that was really the people, you know, so that, that I discovered. So Garbarek was an incredible influence for me. Uh, more lately, I, I, I don't really, I'm not even listening to that many saxophone players, to be honest. Not, I'm not seeking out saxophone players to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose that might be a bit different than a lot of saxophone players uh, approach, but um, I'm very much inspired by uh, Renaud Garcia Fons, um, the um, bass player, French Corsican, um, wonderful, uh, virtuosic five-string double play, uh, double bass player who, who who really has reintroduced uh, the arco or has introduced the arco to uh, the expressive language for improvising musicians. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, uh, so players like that, Dafa Youssef, um, the old player, uh, Hushni Sendrusi, uh, who's a who's a wonderful clarinet player? Uh, are those Balkan players? You know, as as a clarinet double, you can see the old agony stick back here. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you know, you sort of fool yourself. You think, yeah, I'm making some progress, and, and then you hear a Macedonian player play, and you're like, why why are you only 12 and you're able to do that? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, but Hushnu just embodies um, so much of what's that the, that highest vibration thing I was talking about before it's mm-hmm. got the improvisation, it's got the tradition it's got classical training, it's got everything and it's putting all of those elements together in this music which I can only describe as, as close to perfect as I've ever heard um, and at incredible virtuosic level and, and stimulating on so many so many levels, so those are the people who I'm really drawing inspiration from constantly Nice um, Yeah, look, I mean there's, um, uh, I think uh, a lot of saxophone players particularly now, um, are uh, definitely sort of venturing beyond that sort of sound world of just the saxophone and, you know, branching out to other instruments and other styles. And I think, um, you know, for young players in particular, it's really important not to sort of be too insular in your sort of listening and immersing yourself in, you know, other things. Like, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with listening to, you know, um, a, a violin player play or, you know, a recorder player or, you know, even if you want to just, you know, listen to, um, you know, something really avant-garde like... I don't know, can't think. Uh, it's been a long day. But, you know, it's spot on. Like Things like, you know, just sort of that really, you know, branching out is, I think, is a key thing for any musician, really. Yeah, yeah, mm. I couldn't agree more. That, those lateral lines. And it doesn't, it, it's not just about the music as well um, for me. It's, it's, it's more about um, that taking a step towards each other, learning, like, the food culture. The la- I, I always la- learn language something that always came easily to me or I, maybe I've just got developed strands in that in that direction but I speak a few languages reasonably well um not bad for Takaru stew you know what I mean <laughs> but I've I've certainly found that um you know those little um gestures that you make um if you're into this uh, into cultural music um practice uh learning language um share, breaking bread together sharing meals understanding food um culture of, of uh, places understanding the cel- ceremonies um, understanding about the socio-politics and uh, understanding about um, the religions that are at play uh, and all those sort of factors can only really aid um, the, the process of, of le- music doesn't exist in the vacuum. Mm. Music doesn't mm. exist in the vacuum. Yeah. For sure. Um, well, that ties in nicely with this next lot of questions. And I want to talk about um, uh, more practical side of things in terms of, you know, how you practice and, you know, how... Basically, uh, you know, juggling all these different sort of genres and instruments. Um, uh, you know, Stu, you're a fantastic saxophonist. You play, you know, all the saxophones, but you also, you know, do clarinets, the flutes, and of course, all the world instruments. Um, like, how do you maintain such a high level of playing 
um, on each instrument. And uh, the other sort of two part of question. So uh, that sort of maintaining that sort of proficiency on each instrument at um, uh, you know on a regular basis, but also just being able to sort of switch stylistically and you know, put on a different mm. hat on depending on what context you're playing in. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and um, it has been really impacted by what's happened in the last year, to be mm -hmm. honest, because, um, I mean, as a freelance musician, which is what I've spent most of the last 15 years doing, um, you, you, you are really responding a lot of the time, you know. Um, to So I, I'd love to say, yeah, I, I go in on Monday mornings, and I tried to do this at the beginning of this shutdown period, to be honest, in March. I've got it on, on my trusty notepad oh, yeah. <laughs> somewhere, oh, yeah. somewhere in my trusty notepad here. I just tried to write down those con constituent parts of, of what it is that you need to do um, on each instrument um, to maintain chops. Yeah. Because most of the time, I, I guess the beginning of the answer is most of the time um, it's an on-demand thing, but because there's been enough activity um, up until quite recently, you know, performing and rehearsal and, and you know, um, frequency of exposure and all those sorts of things. Um, it's been possible to maintain those doubles just through more or less activity and then a bit of directed practice. But now it's not because we're not rehearsing as frequently as we once were. Um, the performance opportunities are certainly different and I'm finding um, much more highly focused and highly, more highly scrutinized. So um, for instance, um, the, the last couple of gigs I've done at 505 just here in Sydney, uh, have been streamed, um, and one of them was recorded for, I'm happy to say, um, Wangaratta Jazz Festival, as well as the Sydney International um, uh, Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. Women's Jazz Festival. Um, that both uh, concerts with, I'm oh, sorry, it's the same concert, but with Zella Margosi, a wonderful Armenian piano player. And I'm finding um, that level of scrutiny is, is forcing my practice to be far more... Hmm, considered and focused I guess mm -hmm. than it might have been in the past so in the past there was enough activity that you know uh, if, you, if you know you've got a big band call coming up that's got a bit of flute doubling and a bit of clarinet doubling you build up the doubles in the days prior um, and um, I, I, so I started writing this list down of all the doubles that I've got um, and like you've got your basic practice, you've got your repertoire practice, you've got improvisation um, and then you've got even more fundamental things like tone Mm. articulation mm. you know um, dynamics um, breath control I mean the breath is the one thing that links everything together but you you use your breath fundamentally differently playing the nay than you do playing a baritone saxophone for instance so um, there is different conditioning involved in all that and so uh, I got I actually had to stop writing after a while because I had this sort of mind map diagram which was completely overwhelming completely overwhelming and I realized after I'd spent an hour and a half doing this mind map that all I should have done was pick up something and play it do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. So there's there's a level of procrastination sometimes that kicks in but um, it has forced me to, to make more rational decisions and to rationalize um, what it is that I want to put out and at what level so um, while I'm still teaching clarinet for instance um, and playing it occasionally um, I've I've certainly tried to um, reduce the amount of um, clarinet playing that I'm, I'm doing at the moment until I get to a point where I feel like I can represent something of the instrument better, you know. Uh, and actually, to be honest, the same thing with the with the nays. Um, the, uh, the 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 nays uh, at this time of the year, I would normally be working up to a large gala concert, which we do either at the opera house or another nice um, theatre somewhere. And so that's really been my annual, okay, this will be the thing. And actually all the other Nae playing um, comes consequentially um, because of that. I think when where you put energy, uh, you get results, right? Mm. Um, so, and, and because uh, that concert was shut down this year, um, I haven't had the need to practice the Nae's and so I've had to let that double fall, fall away. So... This, uh, you know, coronavirus shutdown period, not just as far as um, getting, it, well, it's, it's all of our activity has been, you know, reduced to, I don't know, like 10% of what it is. Gigs aren't even what they what they used to be. Mm. Um, you know, today I've had uh, four gigs, but very little playing, you know, in, involved with it. It's all online stuff. It's all Zoom, you know, Zooming in. So 
the performance aspects of it have been all pre-recorded. Um, so there's just physically less playing. There's less getting together with people, and and um, it yeah. So I, I'm really trying to focus back in on the, the core, like you know, just reduce it back to the core things: alto saxophone, soprano saxophone, and whatever else the gig calls for. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's really <clears throat> where we're at at the moment. Until until things uh, until the activity picks up in, in whatever form that is going to yep. be, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. Now, uh, just uh, sort of following on with the practice thing, um, and actually the playing side of things, like uh, the the influences that you have from the the non Western music that you've studied and playing and things like that. Obviously, uh, there would be you know some sort of hints of those and um, meshing of those within, say, uh, your jazz vocabulary. So you know when you're doing some solos or something like that. Uh, would would I be uh, correct in assuming that you know every now and again, or yeah, maybe more so, there might be you know some sort of flavors of uh, those uh, types of music in <clears throat> your soloing context? And could you explain sort of how how do you kind of mesh the ideas together? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right, and that's that's the whole sort of purpose of studying it in that way was mm. to try and incorporate you know, that language, that tonal language into my regular, the way I sing, you know. Mm. I, I think of all playing as type of singing, actually, um, because singing was was the first thing that I, I did. I, I used to sing constantly as a kid, mm. and I still sing through all my parts, and I think it's pretty fundamental for lots of us. Not, not for everybody, but um, fundamental for me, certainly, to, mm. to sing. So mm. I, I, it was a matter of incorporating that language into, into the way I sing. Um, and then trying to find um, context for it, uh, you know, in, in order to play. The, the great thing that's happened more recently, okay, so I'll, I'll answer the, the question in sort of two parts. Okay. Uh, right. Number one, sus chords are great because <laughs> uh, most of the time, or a lot of the time, um, the quarter tones that you might want to use are maybe uh, relating to the third or the, the three or the flat three, or it can often be relating to the two or the half flat two. So I might play, you know, um, uh, an, in an E, e Phrygian sort of um, context. Mm -hmm. I might occasionally slip in an E, uh, F half sharp um, as a way. It's it, 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 Usually I'm trying to follow the Arabic rules of, of, of modulation. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, again, pay homage to the tradition. I'm not just plucking notes out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's also limited some, I find the piano a very limiting instrument, generally speaking. Um, and because it's so set, you, you can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I'm playing with pianists, um, either, uh, for instance, with Nick Southcott, I've worked a lot with, uh, with Master's Legacy Ensemble that I've composed a lot of, I would call it all jazz, mm -hmm. but it's, it sort of fits somehow into that world music category because it, we are using Makam and, and all those sorts of things. So we've worked pretty, um, pretty carefully to make sure we navigate that area in a culturally sensitive but also musically sensitive way so that um you know when we do play some of those uh, outside notes that there's context um and it's not a sort of an appropriative kind of um, exercise in look mum i'm being clever um mm. there's something going on and then so that's that one part of it sus chords are really good and yes uh, i have had to manufacture some uh, opportunities to play that sort of thing but then more recently um i've managed to tap in with a, a group of musicians um who have been exploring this area for a really really long time um and it turns out there's been on the fringes of the jazz fraternity or maybe not even the, i don't know if that's the right way to say it mm. um that players you know like uh, well i'm working with um lou and mara keek at the moment and um um you know peter kennard and and um musicians who have been playing who, who understand it about makam even better than i do yeah. um and yeah. so even in the one of the music of Vigor in school shows um, i'm doing at the moment uh we have um, beati it's so got a half flat two uh in the scale and um uh, you know i was i was happy that i could show tim clarkson one of our <laughs> great friends yeah. of course um you know he's he's had to play a, a properly in tune c half sharp there you go man <laughs> <laughs> so i was really happy to, to 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 be that guy who's like yeah man you can play any of these any of these makam uh on 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 the saxophone you just got to know how g sharp's a bit of a problem yeah. so if we do get any yeah. people um, tuning in later on we can talk about g half sharp but i've got a i've got a, a modif modification 
um, proposal, which may may get built one day. But I know that Rap Hackham has done some good stuff in that area as well. So yeah, no, I know the um, the G sharp quarter tones, uh, the bane of my existence uh, in classical playing. There's often works I have to do where there's that fingering, and the only way around it is you kind of have to sort of half close a key, stick your finger in the turn hole to kind of yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a nightmare to do and execute correctly. Yeah, I've I've taken to winding out that bumper screw, uh, and I've got you know three and a half turns exactly gives me the perfectly in tune but still stuffy G half sharp. So mm. right. well, I look forward <laughs> until to the we come up with a better solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? I look forward to the modification when it comes out. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just gonna have that spare you know couple of couple of grand to, to sink into it. Yeah, and totally. all the time. Um, now, uh, moving on, uh, you met, mentioned your uh, your work with the uh, Marsha's Legacy, which is uh, quite a big thing for you. You're the the musical director, the the, the ensemble leader, uh, in house composer. Um, could you t- talk us a, a bit about uh, the concept of the group and um, yeah about the ensemble itself and what it does? Yeah, well, um, so the ensemble hasn't done um, terribly much in the last couple of years. I think our last performance was. Um, well, it was late 2019 for a fundraiser, but um, the last sort of public concert we did might have been uh, even December 2018 or about right. then. Okay. Um, so uh, what Master's Legacy is all about, um, it's a composition project for me, apart from anything else, but it's also an exercise. I, I mean, I've met through, you know, the, the sort of um, normal music pursuits side of things through, through my interests, some incredible musicians who a lot of people... Uh, might never have come across, you know, this uh, a wonderful canon player uh, who we were able to share the stage with many, many times, and a couple of beautiful uh, wood players and um, percussionists and and people from the non-Western tradition um, who are just incredible musicians. So it was about making a platform for that as well. Um, but uh, it's also about creating a platform for integrated art form where there's there's this sort of thing in, especially in Middle Eastern dance. Um, if there's a dancer on, then the, the dancer should take precedent over the the musician. Um, the, the, you know, the dance is really the you know the the big deal. But if you're asking musicians, there's this concept which is about tarab, um, and tarab is about ecstasy in music. It's a lovely idea um, that um, you know I've experienced with lots of musicians, but I haven't really heard it talked about a lot. Again, in sort of formal music circles, is how we react emotionally to music. It's getting talked about more and more these days, but it's sort of less, um, you know, to do with that cold clinical play the A and play it in tune and with the right bit sort of thing. So it's how is it making you feel? Um, and so this tarab idea, uh, and so there's a, an idea that tarab can only be experienced by musicians who, when they're doing this thing for them, like doing music and it's purely music thing. But I've seen dancers in a state of, um, you know, enchantment, and mm-hmm. I've been in that state of enchantment myself. Now, I don't think it's. Um, it's it's related to the form so uh i wanted to create something or we wanted to create something that where the dancers and the and the musicians shared the stage and we were creating choreographies for the dancers and the dancers would inspire the choreographies that we play or the improvisations that we do it's a beautiful like continual flow arrangement um that we had within the ensemble um and so that conceptually that's what it was i wanted it to be a multi you know on many sensory levels um, and on many, you know, sort of artistic fields, you know, um, the dance, the visual side of things, uh, the music, the musical side of things, the conceptual side of things, wanted all, all that to be integrated. Uh, I, I guess what I was really thinking was some of the, the great performances I've seen on big stages um, where it, it, it is very much that multi-sensory experience um, and everything integrated properly. So that's what we were trying to create. And so after, you know, we worked through the concepts of things and, and how to navigate um, all those, you know, uh, critical issues um, involved with, with coordinating something like that. Then we ha- we also had the, the issue of uh, venues to play. Um, right. And so the, the, where I come from really is the small jazz club, you know, because that's where we've been told that we're allowed to play yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, as, as jazz. I'm even not self-identifying as a jazz musician necessarily. It's just where most of my gigs have gone down. They haven't really gone down a lot in concert halls. More, more and more recently, I'm, I'm happy to say, but um, there seemed to be a lack of venues that were appropriately, um, had appropriate facilities for both dancers and um, and musicians. So 
uh, we tried a lot of the, the, the usual suspect venues and, and ended up um, ended up booking out our own venues most of the time. And so doing the whole, um, you know, the, the whole shebang, running the event and running the venue and, 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 Jeez, and doing the whole thing. So um, as I said, the last time we did that was down at Bondi Pavilion. And we had a beautiful show, sold out show and uh, really, really good. Um, <laughs> it's logistically a huge thing to do. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, maybe there's something something in there about communicating um, the, the, the needs that we have as, as artists, as people who want to present our form. We need good stages. We need good theatres. We don't. I don't. I'm sick of playing in places. I'm. I'm sorry. You know, I don't want to offend people who might be listening. Um, but uh, where there's bo- boozy bars and that, I'm. I'm not into it. I, if I want to come and listen to music, come and listen to music. If you want to come and have a like a uh, like a, a good cultural experience, come and do that. And it's not that I'm being pretentious or hoity-toity about it. I just don't want alcohol sales linked to the to my viability as an artist, as a musician. I'm kind of yeah. sick of that equation. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, th- th- there is something about that in in the sorts of um, pursuit or the sorts of links that we had to go to, and the risk taking that we had to do, especially financial risk taking, but also um, devotion of time and all those sorts of things into um, making those events happen, which were well attended, which were culturally significant, which absolutely are all about um, building bridges between disparate communities. Uh, which is all about um, the cultural glue that we really require in this country, which is uh, has also become about a lot of philanthropy, philanthropy on our part. Um, we're getting um, getting involved in social purpose organisations uh, to lend our weight, lend the weight of our artistic um, contributions to significant organisations that are doing really good in the world, not the nasty carry down sort of stuff that happens everywhere but really good stuff in the world, building cultural bridges, um, empowering disempowered communities, those sorts of things. So I'm happy to do that sort of thing. Yeah. And, you know, as I said before, it's, it's a fantastic project. There's, it's a multifaceted thing. It, um, in terms of, as you say, like it's, it's more than just a musical experience. There's, you know, there's the, the dance element and, you know, that just that sort of touching on, you know, different cultures and bringing together different communities that, would you know never necessarily you know mix together in one sort of um concert uh type thing but yeah as i said like it's a fantastic uh, initiative and a, a very original and unique experience and i'd highly recommend go seeing it if we get one of those gigs up sometime soon hopefully fingers crossed we will yeah that's very much you know after this period of you know contemplation that we've all <laughs> been yes. forced to have <laughs> um yeah that's something that's come up quite a lot and um you know things have moved on with some of the players and and um you know there's there's um, some stories in there but um yeah we, we we definitely will be um rolling it back up and, and moving it from strength to strength into the future yeah. cool cool do you have a particular musical highlight um, or performance highlight, I should say, probably more correctly, uh, with this group? And could you tell us about that? With Masha's Legacy particularly? Yes. Or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I think that, I mean, that that um, particular festival we, we played, um, oh, the, sorry, the, um, the the gig that we put on at, um, at the Bondi Pavilion was really a bit of a highlight because it was a success in, 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 in lots and lots of different ways. Um, but yeah, less fresh in, in my mind than um, perhaps uh, other other gigs that I've done more more recently, mm-hmm. um, um, because we you know we're doing uh, so so well. It's this, it's about the community that we created, uh, not created that we became part of, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So Master's Legacy um, has opened the doors for other people to see where their headspace is at and what's going on. Um, so that you know, for instance, Zella Margosian uh, approached and and. Um, uh, it's just a wonderful band. It's very much the same philosophy. It's just taking all those best parts of music and, and, and all that. Um, so the most recent um, performance hi- highlight for me was actually last Saturday. Um, we played, uh, and I've never been to Wangaratta Jazz Festival, but it's it's still up there as being like a you know a real got to do that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, it's one of those bucket yeah. list kind of gigs. Bucket list kind mm. of gigs, and and um, according to some things that I read, we we did very well. Um, we were we were well warmly received and and so I, I don't think it was the best gig ever but I'm I'm glad to have played Wang and, and to have been you know <laughs> touted as one of the best things <laughs> in it it's it does feel like um, the conversation about the music that it doesn't really have a, a label of world music or jazz I think of it as uh, just music just you know just music mm-hmm. it involves improvisation it involves lots of other different traditions of things but 
um, for that it's you know getting high accolades at the one of the peak jazz festivals in the country says to me okay the conversation is now moving in the right direction we've got Simon Barker also at the con um, who's incorporated uh, what he's learned about um, Korean drumming very you know largely mm. Uh, and again, that's through through marriage and through through the situation of life, no cultural appropriation there. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's experience, and and uh, the more we can bring out th- this robustness of our, our experience into the conversation about what goes on with music, I think it's going to be great for the future. Mm, for sure. Um, now, look, uh, we have talked about Marshall Legacy, but you know, you do a, a, a plethora of other things, like your work with Zella and. Um, I'm just going off your website just to name a few. Uh, La La's Live Big Band, uh, Normous Horns. I think most of the saxophone players in Sydney have played with Normous Horns at totally. some stage. Um, Monsieur Cannonball Bear, uh, Lolo Lovino. Um, I, I mean, could you just very, very briefly and in, in a very sort of general context, maybe talk about uh, some other particular highlights in terms of um, uh, groups and other uh, sort of projects you've worked on? Uh, there's there's so many. That's the thing. I, I I'm I'm really in a, a you know a, a great place at the moment that I'm able to collaborate frequently with lots of great people yeah. who um, I've aspired to working with um, you know over over the years. So um, it was incredible. Just recently, uh, we were approached by um, the Indian government to do a collaboration with uh, Rakesh Chaurasia, who uh, his his uncle is um, one of my he- uh, my heroes, Bansuri. Uh, m- m- melody uh, improvising melody heroes is mm-hmm. Hari Prasad Charasia. Um he's uh, Ban- Indian Bansuri player yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was his nephew who um, played the, 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 the Bansuri on this track that we recorded so uh, and with wonderful musicians Chris Fields and Michael Galliasi from from here but a, a, you know a high highly trained high caliber Indian musicians um, that's quite daunting for me because that's one of those cultures of music that I haven't um, delve terribly deep I, I know that that's a massive rabbit hole that you can you can go down is into the indian music land mm. um, and i've sort of i know a little bit about it but um to to do that at that level with those guys was just you know next level for me um little little achievements i i i, I gotta say i i had a real moment i did i did a hair um oh, yeah, right. mm. uh, up until the end of last year more or less right up until the you know um, the christmas before the big shutdown mm. um and hair is uh, yeah I, I like a lot of the philosophy <laughs> in the musical it's, <laughs> uh you know the sort of the founding foundation um points of the of you know what's going on there very very close to home yeah. um and so i had a, a moment um at one of the sound checks beforehand we, we were playing the um the you know concert hall at the sydney opera house and i was on my baritone there and i just let out what we what we saxophone players uh, love to call the brown note yes. <laughs> on the <laughs> baritone uh, at my sounds and so this note just reverberated around the sydney opera house main concert hall and i thought yeah it's shoes in town <laughs> 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 that was cool um yeah i mean it's it's I, I'm looking at the into the future to be honest. I'm very much a person of the present. Mm. Um, we've done some great things in the past. I play, playing in um, the Beirut International Jazz Festival a couple of years ago, and an area which is now essentially destroyed, um, and making yeah. connections with people over there uh, was was incredible. But it's it's also the community things. I mean, I went to Brazil a couple of years ago, um, chasing Brazilian music just purely for for a trip. I spent a month or a month and a half or so, you know, going from various town to town and and playing in community settings. People just taking instruments to little tables, um, and they're all acoustic instruments and and just playing for each other, not playing for an audience, just playing for each other, just wow. for solo pa alegria, just for fun. Um, and and so meeting some of these twelve year old kids who make their own mandolins and write their own choros and improvise like demons that it's just so inspiring to see so some of those are my musical highlights as well it's not the big stage sorts of things mm. it's not it's not like the you know the accolade type um things it's the it's um sometimes just those little points of connection you know yeah um yeah. another another special moment was um in a palestinian town called Akko, where i heard um a, a boy from um, a, a, a shop like a kebab shop playing his nay and the sound of that flute reverberating around the walls was what dragged me in uh, I, I i was almost helpless to resist uh, i have to know about this instrument 
I have to develop a strand of of um, curiosity here because it's it's compelling. Mm. Wow. Yeah. No. It's, it's, like I said, there's there's so many uh, things that you've uh, sort of experienced and um, yeah been involved in, and you know I, I'd imagine it, it's a hard one to answer for sure. But you know I think um, you know you should certainly take note of uh, not only your performance. Your, your own personal performances, but also experiences, um, uh, you know, just sort of being, you know, present to you know, other performances as well. And they often can be quite defining moments for sure as a musician. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, just moving on a little bit more, uh, in terms of, like you, you talked about this before, um, you, you're a really big advocate of building, you know, a sense of community. And, you know, in your work, you're not just talking about, you know, music communities, you're talking about, you know, other, um, you know, other cultures and other streams of performance art as well. And, you know, bringing all these things together to create like a really interesting hodgepodge of, um, uh, of music uh, or performance art, essentially, that's, you know, unique and original. Um, you've also, um, you know, you showcase a lot of this stuff. Uh, I believe you're still doing some radio work. Is that correct as a presenter or is that? Not as a presenter. Like, no, I, um, it's been a while since as a presenter, but okay. um, yeah, occasionally, um, yep. but uh, not, not regularly now. Okay. But yeah, yeah you know, during your time there, you would, you know, play things that, you know, people... Uh, you know, I exposing people to, you know, music and uh, sounds that, you know, may not necessarily be heard on uh, that often, I guess, in on Western radios for sure. But yeah. in terms of um, your, uh, just your perception of how the community has evolved uh, in your time in Sydney, um, like, how do you feel that, you know, that community has, has grown or do you feel like it has grown? And do you think there's any room for improvement in terms of, like, strengthening, um uh, interaction amongst other members of the community, um, whether it be you know in this, that music sort of sector or um, mm -hmm. other performing arts, or uh, again just sort of um, branching out beyond um, you know that sort of Western musical culture, so to speak. Um, it works. It's a, the question works on many levels as well. Uh, um, yeah, I know. Again, Sorry. Again, a really good question. Um, <laughs> no, I'll talk about the immediate community because um, I think that's a really important and pressing thing that. Um, yeah. Maybe we could use some some um, organisational assistance with, if you know what I mean. I'm, I, I, you know, talking about government assistance or something. I don't know quite how to how to foster this, but um, the, the, a lot of the business of being a musician, that this, just the, the professional community is what I'm talking about now. Mm. Um, a lot of that happens at jam sessions or it uh, hangs up the gigs, or you know, where you stay a bit later after the gig and some friends rock up and you have a, a, a you know. A, you hang out together and have a drink or whatever. And um, so that's missing now. You can't go to venues and hang out because all the tickets are sold already. Yeah. And the, yeah. you can't even get comps for your, and I'm, not, I'm not saying it shouldn't be that way. I'm just saying this is the way things are. Um, you can't get comps for your wife or, you, or your kids to come and see your shows anymore uh, because, you know, then you can only seat 50 people because of social distancing. Um, and that is having a massive impact impact my in my opinion on um the way that the immediate professional community is actually interacting with each other uh and it, it it's i guess people are still hanging out within you know if they've got a gig you've got your band you hang out with that little community um but it does seem to be to have fundamentally changed um in this sort of new normal that we're emerging into um mm. and i do think um if we can somehow foster ways for musicians to get together not just musicians it's a mixed community because um you know again music doesn't come doesn't spring forth from a vacuum so um you, you look at uh, the sort of associations that the, the the great musicians had they didn't just hang out with other musos they hung out with designers and artists and poets and um you know, bidding heiresses and, and mm. um, you know, people who make fine rum and <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it, it represents part of the community. I guess that's the essential um, um, reflecting board for, for artists is if your ideas have currency um, outside your own domain, then it's possibly worth representing them um, in an artistic format. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there, there's, there are, I think, not insurmountable problems, but I think that's something that's a bit of a subtle creeper at the moment um, in the music game um, is is the hang is has basically been killed um, by by re social restriction. Um, more broadly in the community, um, well, I mean we're talking now in a time 
it's hard to see. Like, as I say, I live in the moment. I'm, I'm a very in the moment sort yes, of person. Yes. Um, and at the moment, kids can't sing in schools. Mm. It's like, what a dire part of history we're, we're in. You can't sing in groups of more than five in schools. Um, I think singing is fundamental for people. I think community music is fundamental for um Oh, the values of the society. If we're going to be such an impoverished nation that all we do is go to school, go to work, go, come home, eat something, consume something on TV and go to bed. You know, um, there used to be a day when families got together and, and played music together. Um, used to be places that you could go and just hang out and, and um, you know, do all that. You know, the, I, I'm thinking like the Brazilian... Um, social way of, of playing music which happens on a Thursday night most of the mm. time for me um, is we get together at a bar or a, you know a churrascaria like a, um, a barbecue joint or something like that and we play and conversations happen and, and, and music and really great music happens and that sort of thing so w I think fostering music making within the community um, that's certainly something that can be done I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the sort of music making that happens across age groups. Yeah. Um, so it's quite common for, for, for schools to have band programs and kids do band, although, again, that's been sort of impacted at the moment. Um, but it's, I think, more and more and increasingly rare that parents will play music with their kids, that uncle, you know, eccentric un uncle Cedric will come over with his clarinet and you're going to play some Dixieland for the afternoon. Um, that does happen in in um, cultural groups you know I know uh, groups of people who get together and play klezmer and um, gypsy music and um, uh, uh, it's certainly within the, the Indian music tradition um, Carnatic music tradition that's that's certainly happening but I think in diminishing quantities mm -hmm. so if there's something that we as the you know the, the um, protagonists of, of, of something like that um, can do. I think there needs to be more of that continuum between the professional musician and the rank beginner, and that's one that's one thing that I notice about Australia, uh, ha having been fortunate to travel a, a fair bit. I guess is that uh, I think we're we're pretty polarised in this place here. Um, that we don't have such even there's not such a fluid gradient between um, a rank beginner and a professional musician we put musicians up on stages and give them accolades but a lot of people don't partake in music in, in in that way for themselves there's a disconnect there which i think possibly could be could be helped somehow i don't know mm. i haven't got the solutions I, i've identified oh. the problem i think well I, I think that's the thing like i mean uh, yeah there's no uh, one way of doing things i think it's just important to sort of you know see what sort of has has come you know pre-covid and um you know, sort of see what was happening there and, you know, looking at what's happening uh, currently now and then trying to see how best to, you know, improve and build upon and expand and um, reboot, I guess, things uh, yeah. in that post-COVID world. And, um, uh, well, that ties in very nicely with my next question. And again, another bit of a big one. Um, I mean, how do you envisage the, the music scene um, or the musical landscape here in Sydney to take shape in a post-COVID world? Do you see it mm -hmm. becoming more virtual based or do you think there's uh, still, you know, a high demand for live music or uh, what's your take on it? Here's the fingers crossed moment. Mm -hmm. What I'm hoping for is that we're going to enter a great golden age of cultural awareness mm. <laughs> because people have been locked down for a while yeah. and I'm hoping that people are going to want to get out and, and do stuff. Um, I think um, there's less caution uh, than there was, but people are still quite cautious, especially if they're in that older age group. And unfortunately, um, well, you know, we it, it, it typically has been um, wealthier people with disposable income who have um, uh, often older people um, who've been our chief patrons. You know, mm. um, so. What do I see in the, in the post-COVID world? Uh, I see a lot more online, definitely. Online is not a format of music that I can um, engage with on a personal level. I haven't tuned into any concerts, personally. Um, I, I think there's something visceral and human about um, having the you know your shirt move against your, your skin when you hear an, an instrument being played. I, I know that there's something uplifting and, and wonderful. It, I think it was a, a... Oh, was it? No, was it? It was... Um, 
a, a Navy band memory. I remember there was one chart. I was sitting in the middle of the band playing baritone saxophone and there was no Barry part for this one chart. And we were doing a Barbara Streisand something, something, you know, like not normally part of my listening <laughs> experience. But I got to sit in, in the middle of this 45-piece wind orchestra and hear those beautiful suspended harmonies and the beautiful voice leading, this beautifully arranged um, thing. And um, schmaltzy though the piece of music was, it like, you can just feel it doing good for you, you know. Mm. At, at a physiological human level, I do believe that, that those vibrations, maybe it's a psychological thing, maybe it's something different, maybe it's something cellular, but I do think that, you know, a whole band playing an A in tune, it's good for you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that's live performance. So yeah, yeah. Um, the more that can happen, I, I don't know what how they're going to um, manage the, the seating arrangements at the Opera House. I, don't, I really don't. I don't know how they're going to stage um, big musicals. Um, and I'm, I'm quite, um, well, I'm a bit pessimistic having a, you know, I've got a 15 year old daughter who's a drama major at Newtown um, mm. looking into a future mm. that has, well, a, a present that has no musical theatre um, and where all performance opportunities are, are, are shut down. So um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. I think certain things need to happen. Yeah. And I, the other yeah. thing I'll add to that answer is I reckon. Um, unless we can provide a unified voice as much as possible, like to get our thinking together as a community and present it politically, we won't get advocacy, we won't get support. We, we can't stand around waiting for a handout to happen, expecting that people are going to understand what our needs are, because clearly they don't. Um, and you could also argue uh, that there's a big culture war going on at the moment with the way that uh, university uh, universities have been gutted um, and the way that um, certain activities, a lot of the music making activities have been targeted. Um, I'm not saying I disagree with the medical advice. I'm just saying it seems to be being applied in a very subjective manner. Hmm. Um, and I yeah. think unless we can provide, um, you know, like unified voice, uh, speak uh, loudly and and speak frequently at at the right levels. Um, we are going to be purely at the whim of what's going on around us. We won't have self determination as a community. We're just going to get what we're given. And I don't think I like what that looks like currently. Like we're going to get what we're given. Mm, no, doesn't look good to me. So if we can somehow get some, you know, some yeah. weight behind that, yeah. and there's good people doing that at the moment. Well, it was like as you were being involved. In that as you were saying before, um, uh, early on, just you know, just developing that sense of community, like you know, having someone to sort of uh, help, you know, create some sort of a, an organisation or something just to help, you know, represent and structure things a little bit more. It certainly would be a, a key um, asset in you know improving the situation. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah, we'll see what the future holds. Though, I mean, maybe maybe it's all going to be online. Who knows? I don't know, man. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, as I said, it's a big question, but just yeah, just curious to see your thoughts on it. Um, now, just going back to something a little bit lighter for, for the moment, um, but in terms of um, you know, you're a fantastic performer and uh, improviser, and but you know, you, it's also you know, you're a great teacher as well. And again, you know, that wealth of musical knowledge and um, diversity in what you do, you know, you have a lot to offer to um, students and things like that. Could, could you sort of maybe talk us through, like, briefly, uh, it's a bit of a can of worms, but just the, the terms of your teaching philosophy on, like, how, what is it that you hope to pass on to students and what is it that you hope that a student would take away from learning with Stuart Van de Graaff in terms of, um, uh, you know, if there was one thing to help them on their musical journey, what would it be? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll... I'll Okay, I'll relate something that happened just the other day, um, mm -hmm. which was um, with a clarinet student. And um, I asked her if she knew anything about um, Mandelbrot images. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it, okay. it seemed to me that she was being limited purely by the words that, that I was saying, like to say, you just try this, you know. And then I, I, I said, well, do you know about Mandelbrot images? And I, I sort of we talked a little bit about that. Um, and, and we looked at some pictures of them on, on my phone. Just so oh, there's a there's a picture of this beautiful you know, reiterating sequence which goes off into infinity. 
And I said, every field of human endeavor is like that. Like you, you can disappear as far down any rabbit hole as you want. But I think the job of the teacher is to show the door, to, to, to um, introduce this idea. Um, and so <clears throat> what I would hope my students would take is, look, there, there's that thing you can check out, there's that thing you can check out, there's that thing, there's that thing. And they're all, they're all related to each other. They're all part of the same thing. But there's the door. Go and explore. And don't let your ex exploration be limited by just what the, the dots that I put in front of you, um, because that's only the beginning of the story. That's not the that's not the destination. Mm. That's the start. That's the one thing I want. My maybe maybe they don't all get that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's what I I know. Like I, I think even early on, sometimes I joke with students on the first or second lesson. I say I know my job's done when you get better than me. Mm. <laughs> and they look at me and go, oh, that's not possible. And I'm not, not being conceited. I'm not trying to say that. But um, it's of course it's possible. You just put mm. your effort and energy in the right direction and develop your own inquisitiveness about it. And um, I, I'm here to help. You know, I'll help you with things. And, um, uh, you know, there, there's sometimes I would have really much uh, appreciated having someone to say, oh, you know, oh, avoid that pitfall or do this sort of thing or, um, sometimes really simple messages that you get, mm. like don't play over the singer, you know, <laughs> that you, you don't get until an angry singer says, shut up yeah. <laughs> while you're trying to do some jazz behind yeah. her and then you, re or him or her. And, and then you get, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It didn't teach me, teach me that in uni yeah. sort of thing. It's, Where's it's the rule book where it says that? <laughs> yeah. Right. So it, 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 it is sometimes nice to have a mentor who, who can um, point those <laughs> apparently obvious things out to you. <laughs> Um, only obvious in retrospect, isn't it? Every good yeah. idea seems seems simple in retrospect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Now, um, just uh, another sort of educational topic. Um, uh, in terms of uh, learning uh, uh, non-Western instruments and wind instruments, um, I know uh, personally, um, I actually, uh, about 10 years ago, I got this idea that I wanted to learn the duduk. And um, I actually reached out to uh, Kim Sanders, uh, and um, uh, you know had sort of tried to sort of organise, you know, having a few lessons with him. But unfortunately, he uh, passed away um, shortly after that sort of conversation. But um, in terms of uh, players looking to venture into uh, those non-Western wind instruments, and like, what advice would you give them to get started on, you know, picking up, uh, say, the Ney or something like that? <laughs> I, I think people will be attracted to what they're going to be attracted to. Uh -huh. um, that's that's one thing. Um, I certainly know that um, my information is broadened by every new thing that I take on, mm -hmm. and not, not that not that I'm I'm saying you know take everything on because, um, for instance, duduk. Um, obviously, playing with an Armenian pianist, it, it's the very appealing thing to to want to have in the arsenal. But then I looked at the technique required to play duduk. I, I, again, it's just through um, having exposure with the Gasparian brothers through WOMAD. I, I was involved with WOMAD for many, many years. Um, so I got to see and hang out with lots and lots of those, um, you know, international musicians um, from traditional backgrounds at, at the peak of their game, really, some of these incredible musicians. So sitting up next to those guys um, and seeing what's required, it's like the... You know, Dizzy Gillespie bullfrog look, you know, but they do it with their neck. So I realized, oh, Duduk, you're, you're really turning yourself into a, into the, um, the the inflating bag for a bagpipe. Yeah. That's not yeah. going to do so well for my saxophone technique. So I triaged um, Duduk. I've, I've sort of triaged a lot of um, instruments um, and styles and, 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 and areas of thinking just simply because I don't want to dilute the things that I know about comfortably and that's not, not quite the right way of saying that um I, it's possible to take on too much information and become a, a jack of all master of none sort of yeah. thing um yeah. and I, I prefer to focus my energy a, a bit better into into doing that so having said that um if you're a, a young aspirant player who, who's you know come across a shibi or a duduk or a um you know something that's tantalizing chinese flutes or um I remember yeah, Kenna or some of those beautiful um, South American instruments that, that are around the place. Lots of people go for shakuhachi as well. Mm. That's a, my, my hands 
I don't have big hands, so I can't play shakuhachi. I can't fit. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah, go for it. I, I, I don't know if, if I've got any um, really like golden advice type rules, but get get the best instrument you can as early as possible. Same same rules as the saxophone, um, and get the best advice you can as early as possible because, um, and that's not always easy in in the, in the intercultural music you know world because. Mm. Uh, there's sometimes taboos and there's sometimes things that you don't understand about going on in the background before you can actually get to the information. Um, and sometimes it's just as simple as showing an interest in, in people, like, you know, especially with my Brazilian, with uh, my experience with Brazilian music is, is just, right, come and play. So, um, yeah, get involved, don't hold back um, and um, exercise discretion. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I think discretion could be applied to many different things. Um, but um, oh, okay, cool. No, it's good advice. Now, uh, just one final thing, just in terms of you—you're you're a very worldly character, and um, you know you've seen a lot of things and done a lot of things musically speaking. Mm -hmm. And um, we're just sort of um, would be curious to hear what sort of advice you would impart on say someone who's I, I know at the moment with all the COVID and everything like that it's probably not um going to be quite the same as it has been you know 12 months ago and it, as you say like you know it's hard to say what the direction is going to uh, hold for the future but you know advice for uh, say you know freshly graduated con students or something looking to make their mark and and you know become a professional player what sort of advice would you give to a young aspiring player in terms of you know getting out there and getting into the scene is it you know networking is it you know go see gigs go you know as you said you know uh, the hangs of you know yesteryear you know what what would you advise yeah i think all, all of those things i don't think anything much has changed i i do think um in these times the role of the mentor um so let's say if you connect with your your teacher if you're in, in at the con or if you're at a university somewhere learning if you can connect in with your your teacher um, and especially if you've um, sought out that teacher because you're interested in what they're on about, um, then that can be that can be really helpful because then you know you get introduced to networks of people. I think more and more that's more likely to be the way that um, connections are, are made. Uh, I, I certainly know. Look, I'm tempted to say something you know, like um, really um, you know like just pay your dues, man. You've got to go and do the hard yards. <laughs> and there's part of me that really does believe that. Um, I, I think some people can emerge fully fledged as, as um, concert level performers at a young age and can go on and aspire to that sort of thing. Um, and I, I've known a few of them, you know, uh, I, there's a player called an old player called Joseph Tawadras, who I met mm. when he was a teenager. Yeah. Um, and even as a teenager, you can see, wow, this guy, He's in a different category, you know. He's, he's going somewhere, um, as in as indeed he has. Um, but jazz musicians who who only have ever played um, standards in class from a book, um, there's a roundedness, roundedness roundedness of experience that that can only really come with having spent time sweating over a hot saxophone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There's necessary yeah. time, ne necessary time to put in to to to, um, to work through the concepts and also to, to work out those, you know, again those those really simple things um, that might take five years for you to work out that one simple thing, you know, um, like don't play under the singer <laughs> or don't play over the singer mm. um, can be said in a second, but you know it it's it might take you a while to to realize that for yourself. Um, so, I, I, there, there are a lot of young people coming out of conservatoriums now um, who expect to go straight onto the concert stage um, and, and perform at world level. Um, and there's a few of them who, who, who do that. Um, I think there's, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think you, you do need to spend some time um, working on your craft. Uh, I think huge amount of practice goes in I, even after 30 more than 30 years of, of um, playing i still aspire every day for four hours if i can put four hours in every day i'm a happy happy guy if i don't get four hours in I'm, i'll settle for two uh and a day without playing is really um 
yeah, I'm not at my best. <laughs> <laughs> so um, practice hard, work hard, um, and position yourself well. And uh, again, it's it's this socialization socialization thing where we all used to meet people, get inspired by going out and seeing concerts. Um, yeah, see see how we all navigate this together, hey? Yeah, yeah. Um, in line with that, um, uh, obviously COVID nineteen, uh, you know, it's it, we've talked about it a bit tonight. Um, you know, in terms of you know the way it's impacted things, and uh, for you, you're very much as you say, quote, you know, in the now in terms of things, and you're kind of perceiving things of how they are, and you know, hopefully things, you know, improve, you know, down the track. But in for um. Uh, your experiences in COVID-19, um, I mean, it's affected all of us and, you know, it's impacted, you know, our ability to perform and um, a, a lot of us had to, um, you know, uh, adapt and, you know, deal with the, not only just the, uh, the restrictions in terms of, you know, being, you know, in lockdown, but also, you know, the mental impact that it has, you know, not being able to do what you do um, and, you know, being a musician is, you know, integral. Um, uh, to a lot of us and you know not having that ability to do that but for you how did you um, uh, I mean as I said impacted gigs and stuff like that but like you you talked about you know setting up yourself a practice routine and things like that but what uh, sort of things did you uh, was did you have sort of any epiphanies in terms of was there anything that you thought you know brainstormed in terms of you know what you'd like to do post COVID and Oh, sorry, not post COVID, but say, you know, post lockdown and, you know, sort of learning mm -hmm. to adapt and, you know, what, what care to share some uh, insights that you might have gained during this time? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think it, it, you're dead right. There was definitely strategy going on, but um, there was also a lot of fortuitous things um, that happened for me just prior to all of this um, getting locked down, one of which was getting my tax in. <laughs> um, but I also got, I, I'm in my office at the moment, which is a, a studio in, in Marrickville, uh, which I I, uh, I moved into a, in about October um, last year, so about a year ago. Um, and um, look, there's there's a couple, couple of ways you could go. You just, you know, get into a depressive mode and go, well, there's no gigs and it's all sucks and there's nothing going on. And I thought, well, you know, whatever. Um, I've I got my room, so I've got my practice room. So if there's no gigs, I'll practice. So I just, you know, after a bit of thinking, you just sort of go, well, it's always worked in the past. It's, it keeps me happy. It's not really about money. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, yeah. um, you know, um, well, I was able to get onto that job keeper thing. So it's the first time in my professional life I've ever had to, uh, I've ever been able to just slow down and make strategic decisions so this thing which could have been um really really bad i just went well i definitely want to practice i, I, I definitely am still into developing my craft as a performer and as a you know a student of the instruments and the concepts um i definitely want to be in the best shape possible for when the calls start coming through um and i also um know that there's a whole mind body spirit um, aspect of, of what I do as a performer as well. Uh, I just needed to get fit, so I, I, I'd also bought a bike, and my studio is 5Ks from home, so I just ride or run every day to the studio, and I um, got into a good productive routine of practice, uh, and, and um, like I said before, making some tough decisions about which doubles I was going to uh, mm. keep up and which ones I was going to mm. allow to atrophy to a degree. Um, and um, and also making some strategic decisions about well when you do those music activities make them focused and make them uh, make them count um, and I'm I'm happy to say that all of those things um, have borne fruit all all that thinking has borne fruit um, I'd love to be playing more often I looked at my diary from this time last year <laughs> and you know it, it was packed you know like seven nine whatever gigs a week and and different things and you know, concert at the Opera House and something, I came off tour here and, you know, whatever. Um, there was a lot of activity. There was also the prospect of international touring, um, you know, uh, great experiences that we've had, uh, all of which is not possible at the moment. But um, look, I'm glad to say that I've made a, a very successful adaptation to online and I'm, I'm doing a lot of concerts through, uh, through an organization uh, online um, and that's keeping me, um, you know, fresh with gigs and also maintaining that that uh, strand 
Um, but we've also managed to keep live geeks going. Um, and uh, so I've done a couple of shows, three or four shows at 505 recently and Foundry, local clubs. Yeah. Uh, we've got some things yeah. booked um, for the Opera House for later in the year. Uh, as that opens up, um, so December, we're doing a couple of shows down there. Um, and into January, things are looking good. So it's not like there's anywhere near the frequency of what there was before. But it's, you know, for instance, the gig that I'm, I've got a rehearsal for tonight, um, I have a lead-in period of 10 days, which is pretty much unimpeded by uh, having to think about, you know, those 15 other gigs you might have had normally in the in the interim. Um, I can just focus on that gig, and when we get to it, do a more focused and, and better representation of what, what I'm all about, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, ha happy to say that um, after a bit of a period of, oh, holy hell, what's going on here? Um, yeah, things things are things are good at the moment. Mm. It's just about positioning, I think, and and getting onto those projects, you know, like um, digging things out that might have been on the back burner and just going, well, let's do that, make yeah. it happen. Yeah, yeah, um, cool. No, that's it's great. And you know, as you say, like you know, it's uh, I think everyone sort of like you know initially they were kind of like, oh, wow, what? You know, it's like you know, sort of a bit of a a thing but you know you sort of you know things as you say things are starting to pick up and you know i think uh there's a few people out there who's yeah starting to you know get some things happening and yeah preparing for stuff which is cool um all right now tail end of the interview um it, it, again appreciate your time Stu. um and uh i won't take too much more of it but um yeah just a couple of quick ones um first of all uh again i ask all the interviewees this one and just curious to hear your response on this one um if you had 10 minutes to practice what would it be and why <laughs> i love that question um <laughs> depends what's coming up next <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it really does you know if i know that um well you know 10 minutes to practice make sure the reed's working i don't know <laughs> long tones it doesn't count read read maintenance doesn't count oh uh, that, uh, that's not part of the practice oh no, i don't no, know no. No, if I had ten minutes to practice, yeah, I'd, I'd make sure my tone was centered and my breath was working properly. Yep, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's cool. That's cool. Fundamentals. All right, cool. Uh, Stu, thanks so much for your time. Um, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you and picking your brain on your thoughts and perspective on you know what's happening in the scene and um, just really insightful on what you do. And, um, you know, I've learned a lot, like, you know, I've, I've known you for a number of years and, you know, I, there's stuff there I didn't know about you. So it was really insightful for me. So again, thank you for your time. Um, in uh, just in terms of, you know, what keeping up to date with what's happening with Stuart Vandegraaff, um, in line with what you were saying before, like picking up projects and things uh, mm -hmm. that you sort of left on the, the wayside, uh, uh, because being so busy, but, you know, having that time to catch up on things like uh, keeping up with Stu, I've noticed that quite recently you've put together yourself a website and you've also uh, a couple of weeks ago released a, an album called Saving Daylight, which was a big project for you uh, as a, you know, it's your first uh, release as a, a, a band leader in a jazz context. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, this album, Saving Daylight? I'd love to. Well, um, so it's... Uh... In, in essence, it was really a session. I had all of these tunes written over years, you know, some since the 90s, some since I was, a, you know, an undergraduate at, at Adelaide Con, but I had never had the opportunity to play all of them. Or some of them were written for, for purposes um, and, and they had their moment, but they never got recorded or whatever. I've got I've got books full of, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, an avid daily writer, like I'm not a Hermeto Pasquale sort of writer. Um, I'm very much more wait for the moment of inspiration and then, and then just try and, and yeah. ca catch yeah. that. Um, I'm not a diligent, you know, everyday writer, but there's there's a whole bunch of things that were there. And, you know, some stories can only be told through the medium of a jazz ballad. Um, so uh, I, I, it was in 2018 uh, we did this that session um, and down at Richie Belkner's studio, Free Energy Device. I've known Richie since Adelaide days, 25 years I've known that guy. Wow, um, and he introduced wow. me to lots and lots of music, and we we used to skip lectures and go back to his place and listen to records and hang out on the couch and drink coffee and stuff. Um, and uh, so yeah, the, a lot of sort of strands came together. And um, I'd been in Richie's studio a couple of times, and uh, I just thought, well, I, I'm going to make the most of it while I while we can. 
um, and I got uh, on the Saturday I got the band to come in, which is Elson Price and uh, two piano players, uh, Dan Holland and, and Nick Southcott, mm-hmm. um, uh-huh. and uh, Ray Casso came in to do um, a bit of trumpet and, and flugelhorn on that as well. Um, and Dave Goodman, did I mention on drums? Uh, who I, I've known Dave for years and years, but we hadn't played before. Uh, right. We've done a couple of you know gigs, you know, sort of corporate cashy sort of yeah, things, right. but um, nothing artistic. And uh, but we'd hung out a lot because I used to manage a, a shop on Parramatta Road where we had good coffee and a good hang, and so um, got all the lads together. And, and that, the Saturday was with with the jazz uh, ensemble, and the Sunday I got a string a string ensemble. I got Carlson Jacks to put together a string ensemble for me and invited them all in, and we recorded just one song, uh, which we've linked in with um, Carers Australia. It's um, it's drawing attention to the plight of the carer. What happens with with a lot of people who find themselves in the position of being a carer? I don't even play on that tune. It's uh, purely it's well, it's a vocal sort of schmaltzeruni country sort of ballad, but hopefully it gets a few people thinking mm. uh, about that particular issue and I think again COVID's highlighted a lot of the shortcomings and what happens with with that especially with our older people talking about separating generations and and all that sort of thing which I think is you know we lose the best we put the old people um so yeah that that's what that was all about it was really just a session um a lot of the tunes have been compiled over years and years uh it was certainly good to do um and when it came to this time, I, I, I listened back to it just on one of those off days, and I, I thought, well, there's some great energy there. Um, maybe it won't be, maybe it'll be difficult to be in a position in the, into the future where you have such on on fire musicians who can just come in, read some charts, and and and, and lay it down straight away. Um, mm. It wasn't like something that was developed and, and honed with the band over a long period or anything like that. It was really a, a session uh, we went into and, and, and laid it down, and that's what came out, more or less live performances. Um, but I really do think it catches what was going on with all of us at the time, which was that there was a vibrant, active gigging scene where we were all involved in lots of recordings, lots of touring, lots of gigs, um, and lots of hang. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Worth, that's worth putting out there, I reckon. Cool. No, it's a great album, and it's on my um, my listening list for the weekend, so I'm going to be checking that out for sure. Um, but, uh, yes, that's one project, and as I said, you've got the website now. Um, for those watching on YouTube, I'll post a link in the comments below so you can go check out. That uh, has uh, a lot of details on what uh, was sort of what's happening with Stu, I guess you can call it. Yep. Um, and it, you, you've got your Facebook page as well, so you can just sort of keep an eye on those things. And what about uh, upcoming gigs? Anything people can watch out for or book tickets for? Yeah, so we've got the Kim Sanders Friends um, show I think it's on the 14th of November or something like that. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to check my dates for you. They're right here. If it's not in the diary, it doesn't exist. Fair enough. When I, when I say the diary, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I know. the 15th of November, it's a Sunday. We're playing down at Django Bar. Um, we've got, uh, look, there's a whole lot of shows coming up <laughs> with, um, with different things, different sorts of things. But um, with Zella, we're, uh, we're, we're playing at the Opera House on the 18th of December. I think there's two shows. Okay. Uh, there's an early show and a late show, and that's um, in the Udson room, which is a lovely room to play in. I've, I've played in that room before. Yep. Um, and so that should be lovely. And, um, yeah, into January, there's a, 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 um, a couple of recording releases uh, that will be held at sort of gala events, um, one in Marrickville. And uh, we're also hoping to use, make a fair bit of use of um, the newly made available spaces in Marrickville, thanks to some good political decision-making that's gone down there especially yeah. relating to community music making. So, uh, yeah, mm. we'll see if we can capitalise on all that. Nice one. All right, Stuart Vandegraaff, thanks so much for your time this evening. Um, I know uh, you're a busy man and, uh, you know, it's uh, great to have a, a chat and a, a virtual hang, I guess. Um, but, um, yeah, as I said, really insightful stuff and, you know, I learn a lot and hopefully, you know, people watching this learn a lot. But, um, again, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts and, you um, yeah, uh, yeah. Hopefully, we get to catch up face to face sometime soon. Absolutely, I think there's there's some sort of um, sudsy beverage which we'll have to consume at some stage in the future. But thank you, Nathan. It's really wonderful that you're doing this series and a really great resource for anyone who's into saxophone or um, you know wanting to be part of the scene, get part of the scene, learn some stuff from some some good players. Thank you. 
yeah, good thing to sure. do. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, and again, hope you're having a good time. Uh, next week, if you're uh, watching, uh, we're going to be interviewing uh, Dr. Marjorie Smith, uh, who was formerly from Sydney, but is now residing in Victoria, Bendigo, I believe. Um, so we'll be having a chat to her next Wednesday. But uh, until then, stay safe. Um, make sure you wash your hands, of course. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.